Hello, Namaskar, 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 Namaskar. My name is Pooja Devedi. Welcome to my class, The Daily Current Affairs, where you must learn about the significant current happenings from the perspective of your UPSC preliminary examination on a daily basis and also how to tackle those questions with intelligent application of information that also will be taught. Before I begin with the events, I would like to inform you about the various optional courses that we have launched recently. PSIR, Sociology, Geography, History, Philosophy, Anthropology, Public Administration as well as Hindi Sahitya. If you are an aspirant from these or any one of the optional, you can take admission and of course that will be provided to you at a discounted rate. Actual price of each optional is 30,000. But if you provide yourself with the code PD Live, you will get it for 13,999 only. Hurry up, only three days are left. This will be valid till 25th of June only. Let's move forward and talk about the various events that we are going to cover. These are the many events that we are going to cover step by step. Consider the following statements with respect to the Gender Gap Report 2023. This is the World Economic Forum's annual Gender Gap Report that I'm talking about. Iceland is the most gender equal country in the world. No country has yet achieved full gender parity. That means full gender equality on various areas. In India, the share of women in senior positions and technical roles have dropped slightly since the last edition. If you read this report carefully, then only you will be able to answer such questions. Because of course, certain aspects of the report, we just keep on remembering the data and the topmost countries. But sometimes we can also miss information like the share of women in certain areas which has increased or decreased or these kind of statements as well. So that is why it is important to ensure that you read everything in depth because UPSC prelims has changed now. See, Iceland, yes, is the most gender equal country in the world. It has managed to fill the gap when it comes to the gender inequality by 90% and it has remained on the top position for the 14th consecutive year. So this is a really big achievement for any country. No country, which is very unfortunate, has yet achieved full gender parity. 100% gender parity hasn't been achieved in any country as of yet. And yes, in India, although the parity with respect to wages and income has increased, but women's roles in senior positions and technical roles, it has dropped slightly. So first is correct, second is correct, third is also correct. All three will be the correct answer because we had to select the which ones were correct or how many ones were correct. So this is World Economic Forum's annual gender gap report of 2023 that I'm talking about. India has ranked 127 out of how many countries? Out of 146 countries in terms of gender parity or gender equality. India has improved by 1.4 percentage point. India has also climbed up 8 positions as we registered last year. And India marks a partial recovery towards the 2020 parity level. Even we can say that the pre-COVID parity level in the world has achieved that, but the rate has decreased. The country, that is India, has attained parity in enrollment across all levels of education. Alright, so parity is there, so this is a very important takeaway for prelims. India has closed 64.3% of the overall gender gap. Iceland has done it for 90%. India has reached only 36.7% parity economic participation in the country when it comes to that. And there are our neighbors who are ranked better and worse than us. Pakistan, of course, is worse than us at 142. But Bangladesh, China, Nepal, Sri Lanka and Bhutan have performed better than us. So we have to understand these kind of prelims questions could also be formulated. Which countries have performed better than India at the Global Gender Gap Report of 2023? So remember these, I will provide you the PDF, but of course do not just be reliant on the PDF because I will tell you how to ensure you do not miss any information when you read them. Alright, Iceland is the most gender equal country in the world, I have talked about that. And in India, there has been an uptick in parity when, when it comes to wages and income. Although the share of women in technical roles and senior position, it has declined. On political empowerment, India has registered 25.3% parity, women representing 15.1% of parliamentarians. So this is also a big achievement for India, although we have a long way to go. No country has yet achieved full gender parity, but the top nine countries have closed at least 80% of the gender gap there. So if we talk about the top 10 countries, Iceland is there, Norway, Finland, New Zealand, Sweden, uh, Germany, Nicaragua, 
as you can see, Namibia, Lithuania, Belgium, mostly European and Scandinavian countries have done that. Now, Global Gender Gap Report has been actually published since 2006 and it actually measures the gender parity on four key dimensions. What are the economic participation that has been done by women and what are the opportunities that are available to them? This is one. Second is educational attainment. Third is health and survival and then political empowerment. So key parameters could also be asked in your preliminary examination. Make sure to remember it. And this is an annual report. Also remember that. Moving on, consider the following statements. Lab grown diamonds have the same physical, chemical and optical properties as natural diamonds. As of 2021, India is the largest exporter of diamonds in the world. So which of the statements given above is or are correct? Why have I asked you this question? Because a green diamond has been gifted by the Prime Minister of India to the First Lady of the United States. Green diamond as in lab grown diamonds because they do not have carbon footprint and also they are very eco-friendly. That is why they are known as green diamond, not because they are a green in color. Remember that. So these are lab grown diamonds and they have the same physical, chemical and optical properties. That is definitely correct as of natural diamonds. But as of 2021, India is the largest export importer, not exporter. Okay. So sometimes it can happen that during the examination, you become so nervous that you take the wrong answer. So first is correct. Uh, second is not correct. Which ones are correct? One only is going to be the correct answer. Now, the Prime Minister of India is on a state visit to the United States. He has made very special gifts. He has given very special gifts to the United States President as well as the First Lady. And he has gifted a lab-grown 7.5 carat green lab-grown diamond in, uh, to the USA's First Lady. And a special Mysore sandal wood box has been gifted to the US President. This box contains a statue, small statue of Lord Ganesha and a Diya, which is an oil lamp. Other than this, paper masher has also been gifted uh, as in, in that paper masher only, this particular diamond was put and hence gifted. So we will talk about paper masher as well. Lab prone diamonds are also known as CVD diamonds because of the chemical vapor deposition technique that is used to make these diamonds. How does it happen? We will talk about that as well. But the natural diamonds, the properties when it comes to physical, chemical and optical, it's the same for lab grown diamonds as well. And that is why India is trying to build a market over here. It is a thin layer. It is developed with a thin layer when it is cut from a natural diamond as a seed. So when we cut a thin layer from a natural diamond, that becomes a seed. And this seed is 100% carbon. It is polished and then it is placed into a plasma reactor. In this plasma reactor, we will get the same temperature and pressure conditions that we get beneath the uh, earth surface where diamonds we get from the diamonds beneath the earth surface. That is why it's going to be a similar process. That is why they are so similar in nature. And one thing we have to keep in mind over here is that during the process of formation of natural carbon, certain impurities and impure gases also get trapped. And lab grown diamonds, we cannot see that happening. So what happens that lab grown diamonds are much purer than the natural diamonds and eventually the carbon particles they begin to in disintegrate and start forming layers on the original seed that we cut from the natural diamond in the plasma reactor it has all been done and that is why India is trying to build a market because we have been the largest importer of diamonds as of 2021 and in 2021 India has reportedly imported diamonds worth 26 billion dollars so when uh, and uh, you know gifts such as these are made it shows that india is trying to promote its industries as well the word sahtasas refers to what a hymn or him it's actually a him a craftsperson a coin a decree the correct answer to this is a craftsperson so let's move ahead and talk about why have i asked you this question i have already told you that the Prime Minister has gifted this green diamond in a paper mache box. And this is from Kashmir. It is a paper mache craft which originated in Kashmir. And it is actually based on Kari Kalandani. So this is known as Kari Kalandani, the process through which it is made. It is named after Kalandan or pen stand, right? Kalandan or pen stand. And in the 13th century, the Kashmir paper or Kosur Kagas, it was very soft after paper because it was high in quality. 
and the demand for kalamdans which were decorated with kari kalamdani was also too much in the 13th century so kari kalamdani is also referred to as kar e munakashi okay so there is a process through which this paper paper mache boxes created such a beautiful box so moving on if we talk about the process it goes through two processes first is the mold making when we make the mold of the box and this is known as sak sazi and it is done by sak saz who is a sunni muslim crafts person okay so mold making is done by a sunni muslim crafts person who is from kashmir and he is known as sak saz and then comes the nakashi which is the painting who does the painting it is done by the nakash who is a shia muslim crafts person it's a beautiful amalgamation of the two sects then first the sakta sas prepares the paper pulp by pounding the paper this includes shredding and soaking of the paper multiple times then it is mixed with straw cloth and copper sulfate it is shaped with a mold once paper pulp has been pounded and shredded it is covered by a mold generally it is clay but now plaster of paris wooden or metal molds have become popular then another layer of paper is used to separate the paper pulp and mold before it is applied to the surface then glue is applied to hold the entire mixture together and after it has dried the mold is cut off carefully and when it is cut off in half then it is again you know put together with the help of thick glue and then finally a layer of glue and chalk is painted onto the inside and outside surfaces of the object and then it is smoothened with the help of baked brick which is known as kirkut so that is sak sazi after that we have nakashi that means painting the surface very properly so this begins by coating the surface with a white solution which consists of gypsum and glue it is then further polished with a wet stone so that it becomes perfectly smooth then base colors are applied such as white blue black red or gold and then designs are made which are free hand in nature these are made with the brushes which we get from the pashmina goats for uh, hair and pencils from cat fur okay remember that it could be asked in your preliminary examination the areas which are going to be painted in darker colors first a white base is uh, you know put out then the darker colors come into the picture and where lighter colors are to be done it is done without any sort of coating and the base layer of color which is visible through the designs is known as pardas the designs created are either raised or flat that means it could be either raised which is resembling relief work or it could be flat as well then it is finally finished with the help of varnish so that luster could be seen and it is also seen in different architectures of kashmir like the khatam band architecture of kashmir in different mosques such as madin sahib mosque shah hamdan mosque and even the shalimar gardens mughal period doors palanquins windows also had this particular uh, you know art painted onto them and the uh, very important person who has done so much for the paper mache craft is fayaz ahmed jan who was conferred with the padma shri in the year 2019 okay so paper mache craft is also you know getting its glory back that is why a question could be asked from here now if you want to get enrolled into our prelims to interview batch you must do it as quick as possible we have three separate batches hindi english and english now if you want to prepare for all the three at one place this is the correct batch for you if you want to take admission do it as soon as possible why am i saying this because we have limited number of seats once you get enrolled here you will not need to go to anywhere else for prelims test series mains test series answer writing practice everything is included in here so if you want to do it please do it asap and use the code pd life to get a discount actually it is for 70000 but if you use this code you will get it for 29999 only we are closing in on our admission on 30th of june all right moving on consider the following statements there are over 200 openings but the traditional number is 108 aitreya chandogya and brihadaranya brihadaranika are the principal upanishads and the upanishads are considered the end of the vedas so how many statements given above is or are correct yes there are actually 200 upanishads that is definitely correct traditional are 108 and principal upanishads are 10 there are 10 principal upanishads in which we have aitreya chandogya and brihadaranyaka so it's important that we know such divisions and yes 
Vedas actually tell us about the fundamental existence of human beings. When Upanishads start building bases on Vedas, hence they are known as Vedanta or the end of Vedas. Okay, so first, second and third, all three are correct. All three will be the correct answer. Why have I asked you this question? Because Prime Minister Narendra Modi has gifted the rare first edition print of the 10 principal Upanishads to the US president. US president is smitten with WB Eats. And that is why it happens so that WB Eats, with the help of Purohit Swami, Shri Purohit Swami, published this particular book in English in the year 1937. And that is why this has been gifted to, to show the admiration for Joe Biden as well, the US president, and also Joe Biden as he is smitten with this particular poet, uh, WB Eats. It becomes another soft power of India. Now, in 1937, W.B. Eats published an English translation of the Indian Upanishad. This was co-authored by Purohit Swamiji. And the copy of the first edition actually was published by M.S. Faber and Faber Limited of London, which was printed in the University Press, Glasgow. So these kind of questions could be asked. What are Upanishads? Upanishads are important as philosophical as well as religious text of the Sanatans or the Hindus. Actually, the word Upanishad means sitting down closely, which means when the teacher or someone who is very authoritative is speaking, we must listen to them closely. And simultaneously, they have been understood as secret teaching or revealing underlying truth. So if it is asked in your examination about Upanishad, which philosophical text is considered as secret teaching or revealing underlying truths, it is the Upanishad. And the concept which has been presented by Veda, which is the knowledge, which generally uh, is said to or is believed to be uh, Shruti, based on Shruti. The sages heard the vibrations of the universe, told them to the generations that followed after them. And that is why we have the Vedas on the basis of that. So Vedas give, up, give us the concept of human beings. And that concept, on that concept, Upanishad keeps on building the and elucidating the concept and that is why Upanishads are known as the Vedantas or the end of the Vedas. Now if we talk about the origin of the Upanishads, it is not very clear but it is believed that between 800, C to 800 BCE to 500 BCE, we had the first six with, uh, Upanishads, first six Upanishads from Brahadaranyaka Upanishad to Kena Upanishad. Okay, and other than that, all the others were uh, published at a later stage. This is what the belief is. The important 10 Upanishads include these many. Isha, Ken, Katha, Prashan, Mundaka, Mandukya, and Tatriya, Aitriya, Chandogya, Brihadaranika. Okay, so these are the 10 principal Upanishads. These questions could reflect in your paper. With respect to the Delimitation Commission, consider the following statements. In India, Delimitation Commissions have been constituted four times. Its orders have the force of law and cannot be called in question before any court. And the chief election commissioner is the ex official chairperson of the delimitation commission. So how many statements given above is or are not correct? Again, these are the certain keywords we have to keep in mind. Do not get nervous in the examination hall. With respect to delimitation commission, which is an authoritative body, a very uh, authoritative body when it comes to limiting the territorial constituencies. Yes, the first statement is correct. In India, it has been done for four times. Through certain acts, these delimitation commissions have been formulated four times and its orders have the force of law. That is very correct. And they also cannot be questioned in any court of law. If they are placed before the parliament or the state legislative assembly concerned, no modifications are accepted or made. Okay, so first, second, both are correct. And the chairperson of the Commission, Delimitation Commission, they are appointed by the central government. Ex officio member, it is the chief election commission. He or she is the ex officio member, not the chairperson. The chairperson is appointed by the central government. All right. So, first and second are correct. Third is not correct. One only will be the correct answer because we had to select the not correct statement. The election commission has recently released its draft proposal for delimitation in Assam and they have also suggested that we should increase the seats which are reserved for scheduled castes from 8 to 9, for scheduled tribes from 16 to 19, so that whatever the demographical change has occurred in Assam can be reflected through the 
parliamentarians and the legislative assembly holders. Now, delimitation is actually an act or process of fixing limits or boundaries of territorial constituencies in a country also for provinces which have legislative assembly so that elections can take place. Proper representation of population can happen. It is also known as Boundary Commission. In India, we have had four such commissions. In 1952, under the DCA of 1952. In 1963, under the DCA of 1962. In 1973, under the DCA of 1972. And in 2002, under the DCA of 2002. And as I told you that, yes, it is a high power body. Its orders have the concentration of law. It cannot be asked questions in any court of law. And these orders, they come into force when the president decides so on its behalf. The copies of its orders are laid before the houses of the parliament and the state legislative assembly, but there can be no modification. So powerful it is. And as I told you, there are three members actually in the delimitation commission. And two members, each of whom shall be a person who is or has been judge of the Supreme Court or of a high court. So they can be either an ex-judge of the Supreme Court or the High Court or a presiding judge. So this could be a very good question for your preliminary examination that the chairperson has to be an ex-judge of the Supreme Court and High Court only. No, they can also be the serving judges of the Supreme Court or the High Court. So two person, two member will be there and then the chief election commission commissioner will be the ex-officio member. All right. And the central government shall nominate one of the members appointed under clause A of the subsection, subsection in this to be the chairperson. So it's the central government who appoints the chairperson. With respect to Somalia, which of the statements is incorrect? It borders the Gulf of Aden. The equator passes through the middle of Somalia. It is bordered by three countries and it has a border with Kenya. So that is why I have asked you this question. A military base in Somalia has come under attack by Al-Shabaab jihadists. This is happening as the African Union is withdrawing its troops from the war-stricken area. Now, if we talk about Somalia, this is Somalia having a border with the Gulf of Aden in the north. And as you can see, it is bordering the Indian Ocean. Here is the equator which is passing from the south and not the middle of Somalia. It is bordered by the countries of Djibouti, Ethiopia and Kenya. All right. So, as I told you, the first statement will become correct. Second is not correct because the equator passes through the south of Somalia. It is bordered by three countries, yes, Djibouti, Kenya and Ethiopia. Alright, so that also becomes correct and it has a border with Kenya. So option B will be the correct answer over here. Moving on, from west to east, uh, arrange the following holy places in the correct order. Gangotri, Yamunotri, Badrinath, Kedarnath. Okay, so we have the codes where we have to choose from. Chardam Yatra is ongoing in Uttarakhand and 10 lakh people have visited Kedarnath as of now. And these are the different data that have been presented. How many people have visited the different shrines in Uttarakhand? So here we have Yamunotri, Gangotri, Kedarnath and Badrinath. When we, when we go from west to east, first we will have to go to Yamunotri. Then we shall go to Gangotri, then Kedarnath and finally Badrinath. Okay, Gang Yamunotri, Gangotri, Kedarnath and Badrinath. Now see, uh, Yamunotri, Gangotri. Kedarnath and Badrinath 2143. Okay, 2143 will be the correct answer that is option D. So these kind of questions with respect to map base they could also come. With respect to rainforests consider the following statements. Temperate rainforests are not as biologically diverse as tropical rainforest. Rainforests now make up only 6% of the earth's surface. Area wise Arunachal Pradesh has the largest forest cover in India. What do we have to see? How many of the statements given above is or are correct? Temperate rainforest, yes, because the tropical rainforest receive a lot of rainfall and the temperature variation is also uh, very conducive. The so, tropical rainforests have a lot of biodiversity if we compare it to the temperate rainforest. So first statement becomes correct. Rainforest actually just forms 6% of the earth's surface. Second is also correct. Area wise, it is the state of Madhya Pradesh, which has the largest forest cover in India which is followed by Arunachal Pradesh. That means Arunachal Pradesh has the second largest forest area cover. So first, second, these two are correct. Third is not correct. 
two only will be the correct answer. Today is World Rainforest Day. It has been celebrated annually since 2017 as it was launched. Despite covering just about 6% of the Earth's surface, rainforests are home to around 50% of the terrestrial biodiversity. They sequester carbon, they regulate the atmosphere where they are situated. That is why they are known as the lungs of the Earth. All right. Tropical rainforests, they are situated between the two tropics, Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn. As you can see, in India, we have the Western Ghats in Northeast India and even the islands of, uh, we have the islands of Andaman and Nicobar. And they are presented over the globe in Central and South America, Western and Central Africa, Western India, Southwest Asia and the islands of New Guinea and Australia. So in India, when we talk about tropical rainforest, they are found in Western India. Remember that. And the temperature is pretty high as they are receiving the direct sunlight. So it is between 21 degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius. And the average humidity is also a lot, 77 to 88 percent. Because of this, they receive a high amount of rainfall because of the transpiration and evaporation that is taking place because of the heat and humidity. That is about 200 to 1000 centimeters of rain per year. Because of this, they are, most, they are the most biologically diverse regions of the world. The Amazon rainforest is the world's largest tropical rainforest. When we talk about the temperate ones, they are found in the mid-latitudes. They are generally found in the coastal and mountainous areas. Because they trap the heat from the coast and as the mountain traps them, then also they get a lot of rainfall. And rainfall is very high here as well, not as high as the tropical rainforest, but they are found in the coast of the Pacific Northwest, North America here, coast of the Pacific Northwest, okay. Then we have in Chile here, in the United Kingdom, okay, New Zealand as well. And many other countries like Southern Australia, we have in Norway as well. Their name as implies they're much cooler as we compare them to the tropical rainforest. They are having the, den uh, they're having the range of temperature from 10 degrees Celsius to 21 degrees Celsius. They are also much less sunny and rainy. But we have observed an ample amount of rainfall over here. Per year it is 150 to 500 centimeters. These are not as biologically diverse as the tropical rainforest. Area-wise, Madhya Pradesh has the largest forest cover in the country. Then it is followed by Arunachal Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Odisha and Maharashtra. In terms of forest cover as percentage, that means the land that is present in the state and of that land, how much forests are present. This is the percentage. So percentage is most in Mizoram, then Arunachal Pradesh, Meghalaya, Manipur and Nagaland. Alright, moving on. Now, if you want the PDF of my class, you can be a part of my Telegram channel, which works under the name of Pooja Devedi Study IQ UPSC. If you have any questions or doubts regarding UPSC, you can contact me on my Instagram as well. Thank you so much for watching.